Thank you very much. I'll try not to be as boring as that introduction implied I am. Um, this is my first TED Talk, and the first TED Talk we've held here at Asade. And every time I've seen TED Talks, I've noticed there's, there's a particular sameness to them. They, they, they all have the same look and feel. And there's good reason for that, I found out. I, I've received this list of instructions of things to do and things not to do at a TED conference, and I, and I guess we've all received these. So to, to begin with, do not read your talk. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, do not wear a tie. Be personal. Show the real you. Make the complex plain. Dream big. Connect with people's emotions. And I have to do all these things within 18 minutes. Okay? So, well, I've already read, so that's done. You'll notice no one at TED conferences ever wears a tie, and I, and I, and I guess this is a pretty serious rule. And so, it, it, because the theme of this conference is creativity and innovation, entrepreneurship, I thought, what a radical, bold innovation if I actually wore a tie. But getting a tie in here is not that easy, so I had, I had to get it past the, the, the guards out there. <laughs> and see, the organizers, and the, the TED bodyguards are going to come out and attack me. Um, but but, but then, then I started talking, and, and it turns out if I put this tie on, I will not appear on the TED website. So they're serious about this, and I don't want to mess with the TED organizers, so I'm just going to put it down here. <laughs> okay, be personal. So I'm going to tell you about myself for a little bit. Um, specifically, an interest I have, this is my guitar. I received this guitar uh, about eight months ago. It is a handmade guitar made by a luthier in Atlanta. His name is Kent Everett. You can see his work on everettguitars.com. It's fairly expensive to buy a handmade guitar, and, and I'd like to show you some of the... This is how it starts. This is Brazilian rosewood, and that's the back and the sides, and this gives the guitar certain tonal qualities that are, are very important. And then they have to be... This bracing has to be there because this wood is very thin. It has to vibrate, but at the same time, it's under tremendous pressure, so it has to be supported. Then the sides have to be bent. Notice how much work goes into making this guitar, how much manual labor, and you know, what a project of affection this is for the guy who makes it. Now, this is the neck of the guitar, and what is really interesting is, is in, in addition to building this thing, the choice of woods is very important. Right? So woods, as a product of nature, they're all flawed. They all, have, they all twist and turn and have, have imperfections. And the guy who makes this has to work with these in the right way. So all wooden instruments are particularly sensitive to humidity. And this is a big problem for them. So if, if, if one would twist one way and the other would twist the other, the reason that you laminate them and put them together like this is you can have the twist work together. And by working with the imperfections in the wood, make something that's stronger. Okay? And this is really important. It's an important part of the task of building the guitar. That's the back. And that's the neck. That's her. I've actually given her a name, Josephine. Um, that's Bobinga, and this is Ebony. And it's, so, so I could talk about her all day. She's beautiful. Um, I could have spent a lot less money on a guitar. I'm not going to tell you how much I spent on it. But um, I didn't, because then it wouldn't be a handmade guitar. And if you look at this, there are a lot of imperfections in it. There are a lot of imperfections from the wood. There's a lot of imperfections in craftsmanship. But that's what makes it beautiful. That's what makes it valuable, and that's what makes it natural. Okay? And the choice of woods, the selections of woods, and their imperfections, they have aesthetic qualities, they have structural qualities, and they have acoustic qualities. And bringing all these flaws together in the right way is an important part of building this instrument. When, when, when you spend this much money on something, you want to tell the world about it? So I'd like to thank the, editor, the, the organizers of the TED conference for giving me this platform to tell you about this. OK, enough about me. I'm going to take some water here. The next, the next thing we have to do is make the plane simple. I'm going to talk about computers. Since I'm so interested in music, I've followed the use of computers in the creation and consumption of music for some time. And this is a topic that fascinates me. So if we turn it around. Um, computers are good in creative processes for a number of reasons. They're very good at identifying patterns that you and I wouldn't see. They're very good at what we call combinatrics, that is, putting things in new combinations that you and I would never do. 
and they can use the raw power of computers to do these in many, many iterations very quickly in a way which is cheap, economically cheap. One of the most important things about computers is they are not constrained by human sociology, okay? We know that human culture, human social norms, are one of the biggest enemies of human creativity out there. And so when you look at videos of Google or Ideo or something like this, they all have slides and games and toys and so forth. And the purpose of these things is simply to create a social contract within the organization that you know, the bounds of acceptable behavior are not from here to here, but rather from here to here. And if you do something that's outside of the bounds of normal behavior, no guy in a black suit's gonna come and sanction you socially. It's okay to do something that's a little bit ridiculous. And they know this at these companies, and this is why they celebrate play as, as a source of innovation. Computers don't have this constraint. They have no social norms. And so they can come up in, you know, in processes like evolutionary computing and so forth, come up with solutions to problems that you and I never would do, okay? You saw in some of the other videos celebrating children as doing things and saying things that adults would never do because we all know by the time we're adults, the educational system has pretty much ruined most of our creative zeal, our creative abilities because of all the social sanctioning that goes on in the system. Computers don't have to deal with that either. That makes them good. But remember, very often, human sociology is one of the largest enemies of creative endeavors. So, this is, going down or up, good. This is Auto-Tune. Auto-Tune came out of the late 90s, and basically what it does is it takes a musical signal, and if it's not where it should be in terms of frequency, it'll put it up to the next half position, right? Um, Auto-Tune was used a lot in recording studios where people who don't sing exactly on key, the computer will go up and put it on key, so it sounds perfect to us. Later, a lot of pop musicians who don't sing well or are not classically trained and so forth have realized because electricity travels so much faster than sound waves, these things can be used in live performances, right? So there's a big crisis now of artists like you know, Lady Gaga, Madonna, whomever, who are using these things in live performances and, but not being honest about it, not telling people about it. And this is quite controversial. It's rather interesting, okay? So, in, 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 and actually, you'll see a lot of artists coming out now saying, well, we, we, I don't use auto-tune and so forth, or this music was produced without auto-tune. And, you know, if you see Lady Gaga running around on stage with all these people huffing and puffing and doing things like an Olympic athlete might do, and she's still singing on key, something's probably wrong. <laughs> okay? Now, they will actually discuss this in the music industry, and they'll say a lot more people are actually using this than actually will tell you about it. Okay? Um, but, but the, the, the thing is, is, you know, what's wrong with it? And fundamentally, it's, it's a social contract they have with the audience. People come to see a live performance of someone, and they don't expect it to be corrected by a computer. Now, the pop industry responds quite interestingly. They say, well, what's the difference? This is not reality you're seeing anyway. You know, her hair color is artificial, her anatomy is artificial. Who cares if the sound is artificial? It's all the same thing. If you want reality, don't come to a performance. This is fantasy, okay? So this is quite interesting, and, and, and the controversy goes on. It's been used in X Factor and American Idol and so forth, and then when people found it out, they took it away later. Now, this is not restricted to the cultural lowlands of, of pop music. Um, in many, many symphony halls around the world, they're beginning to install what we call electronic correction systems. So if you study acoustics, there are many, many, many dimensions one can play with about you know, when the first sound waves arrive versus the, the reverb or the secondary sound waves and so forth. Many, many factors you can play with, but basically in concert halls they're installing microphones, putting in speakers and so forth. So when symphony orchestras perform, people who are classically trained and should be able to play without electronic correction, they're actually using these things to create particular tones. You'll notice this is an article that appeared in the New York Times, and it says, well, yeah, we put this in, but we're not telling anyone because we don't want to disappoint our audience. It's not part of the social contract that we have with our audience. Music is all about connecting between the performer and the audience, and there are certain rules that you don't violate. This might violate their expectations, and that's problematic. Now, let's see what comes up on the next video here. Can we play this video? 
about 30 seconds. a holograph. She and her voice is entirely computer generated. The fans are real and the people performing behind her are real. But I mean, isn't this weird? You've got a lot of people coming out to see a holograph perform. Okay? And she is actually her next concert is in Los Angeles in July, if you'd like to fly out and watch her perform. So she performs and so forth, she comes out of Japan. This is just downright odd, actually. And, 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 but the audience love it because it's an explicit part of the social content. Yeah? Okay, that's enough. Okay. Now, there is a lot of, given that the computers are coming into musical performance and musical creation more and more and more, there's a lot of study into what actually is music and where it occurs. This is a book by a guy named Daniel Levitin, and he's, his book is This Is Your Brain on Music. He's a cognitive scientist. He does a lot of neuroimaging and so forth, and MRI scans and so forth, and listens to, you know, when people create or listen to music, watches what happens up in the brain. If you think about music, it's just a bunch of air molecules moving around. Music happens up here. It doesn't happen out there. And what they're able to do is understand, um, you know, human cognitive processes around music. But moreover, the computers, what they can do is you can take a piece by Chopin or Bach or Madonna, whomever, run into the computer and play it perfectly. Okay? Technically, the music can be played perfectly by the computer. But what they found out in lots of laboratory experiments is people aren't moved by this. Right? Music should be emotionally moving for you. But when the notes are played perfectly, it's not that exciting. It goes flat. And they're realizing what makes music emotionally appealing, emotionally exciting, is when the music sets up certain patterns and expectations, and then they go boom, and violate those expectations. It's this, this pattern setting and violation of pattern settings, making and then violating expectations that makes music emotionally moving, or holding notes a little bit too long, or a little bit too short, or a little bit too loud. So what they've done is they've taken these pieces, and they've had the computer introduce random errors into it, to see if just you know, randomizing the air makes it more emotionally moving or not. And it doesn't. They can't find any type of correlation or any measure. So the big project here is to try and figure out what human error is, how it works, and how to reintroduce it into the music that the computers are generating. Now, this is a little bit odd. I mean, if you think about it, we've come full circle. Autotune is trying to remove the human error, and they're trying to put it back in. It's a little bit, little bit paradoxical. Now, he's a, he's a serious scientist, and he's not doing this to, 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 for any reason. Um, but, but, but he's trying to understand human cognition as a science, and that's what he does. But the irony of this is huge. I mean, if you think about it, if you want human error in your music, you could come home to me and listen to me play, right? Spend time with me and my friends, and we'll give you lots of human error, some of it the good kind, but a lot of the bad kind, but we'll have fun. You can look to each other. I mean, there's a world inhabited with humans and so forth, okay? But this is where the issue of creativity in computers is coming. It is trying to figure out how to be imperfect and to do it in a human way. If you talk to people who work in computer animation and movies and so forth, they'll tell you the same thing. The big problem is making something imperfect in a natural way. So you remember the scene from the Titanics, the movie The Titanic, the ship looked artificial, right? And making that ship look real was a problem that the computer animators could not solve quickly enough. So this is where we are with music. Point five, dream big, connect with people's emotions. All right, changing topics. How many of you know who this man is? No one. I'm very disappointed. This is Alan Turing. Alan Turing is a British mathematician. He worked in England during the World War II, primarily working on encryption problems, trying to help break the German enigma encoding box and so forth, the system. 
Um, he is also considered the father of computer science, the father of artificial intelligence. He's made tremendous contributions in the field of philosophy. Many of you have heard of the Turing test, um, uh, biology, these types of, of, of things. Every year, the computer science community gives out an award for greatest contributions, and it's equivalent to the Nobel Prize in computer science. It's called the Turing Award. Everybody who works in this industry knows who he is. Alan Turing committed suicide at the age of 41. He was convicted of being a homosexual in Britain, which was illegal at the time. Okay? And because of this, he was forced to undergo estrogen treatment. And he was security clearance was removed, and this was a very humiliating, depressing experience for him. So he took his own life at the age of 41. In 2009, Gordon Brown publicly apologized for this. He said his treatment was appalling. He really didn't do anything wrong, and it was a tremendous loss for humanity in general. But you know, basically what Alan Turing did was he was off tune. He sang out of tune. He was outside the social norms. And once again, human sociology was its own worst enemy. So when we think about, you know, every time new technologies have come out, whether they be the telephone, the radio, the airplane, the television, the computers, mobile phones, Facebook, what have you, critics have looked at these technologies and said, oh no, they have destructive effects. They're destroying the social fabric of our time and so forth. And I, as a parent, can't help by looking at things like holographs and autotune and, and feeling the same thing. And so, you know, and, and, and chances are, you and my children will grow up and have a completely natural relationship to these technologies and everything will be just fine. But one thing we can do as parents is let your children sing, let them sing off tune. This is where good things happen. It is natural and it is beautiful and it's very valuable. Okay. Very good. That's number five on my list. Thank you very much. <laughs>